So I'm sure most of you know about the big announcement coming from Six Flags Fiesta, Texas. They're opening a B&M dive coaster called Dr. Diabolical's Cliffhanger, located over by Roadrunner Express in Iron Rattler. This announcement was a surprise to a lot of us. Not only is this the first dive coaster in the Six Flags chain, it's their first B&M edition in 10 years. This announcement wasn't only significant for Fiesta, Texas. It was significant for the chain as a whole. Today, I'm going to evaluate Dr. Diabolical's cliffhanger and dive into what it could signal for the future of Six Flags. Six Flags is no stranger to B&M. They were the first ones that ever order a B&M, Iron Wolf at Great America. They also got the first floor list, first invert, one of the first hypers, and eventually one of the first wing coasters. It's funny that most of these are from Great America, but this was the 90s, and Six Flags was kind of stupid in the 90s. Don't get me wrong, it was great for us, but why would they pack multiple coasters into small parks year after year? I have no idea. This led to a downward spiral that bankrupted them, and when they came out of that, the price tag on those B&Ms drove them away. They did pay for X-Flight at Great America, the one and only wing coaster in the chain, and that opened in 2012, but that was it. Post-bankruptcy Six Flags brought an era of cookie cutter clones and other inexpensive coasters. Though, thanks to RMC, they've been some pretty high quality rides, but even their big parks were getting the smaller, shorter rides. Magic Mountain got a Zack Spin, Great America and Great Adventure got SNS Free Spins, Magic Mountain and Great America got modest sized launch coasters, and then Magic Mountain and Great Adventure got the single rail model, and those are an absolute bargain. The smaller parks ended up with free spins, or other gimmicky rides, or flat rides, but they all got something. This is something Six Flags wore proudly. Every park was going to add something new every year. The CEO of the company, whether it be John Duffy or Jim Reed Anderson, would make a video announcing all the new rides for each park. Nobody got anything spectacular, but everyone had a new reason to visit their home park every year. It was a bold strategy, and in theory, not necessarily a bad one. But their new CEO as of 2019, Michael Spanos, seems to want to do it a little different. Let's look at their main competitor, Cedar Fair. Just like Six Flags, they have their favorite parks, their parks they seem to neglect, and then the ones in the middle. Not everyone gets something new each year. This frees up money for one or two big time investments every year. So some parks will be left in the dark for a year, or two, or more. But those lucky enough to get Cedar Fair's money will have an elite ride, and they can market that and draw people from all over the country. Over the past decade, these chains have been using different methods of investment, and there's little doubt that Cedar Fair has been more successful financially. Cedar Fair also charges more for everything, from their platinum season passes to their dining and drink plans, and Six Flags chooses to charge less and sacrifice a little quality. Six Flags Fiesta Texas president Jeffrey Siebert confirmed that there will be no company-wide announcement for the 2022 editions. To me, this says that not every park will get something new, at least for now as the chain comes out of the pandemic, and it could signal a permanent change in strategy. The parks that will get something new will announce it on their own schedule, as we saw with Fiesta Texas, and will end up seeing with Magic Mountain later on. So if the new CEO is moving away from everyone getting a new ride, and Six Flags is giving Fiesta Texas the chain's first B&M in a decade, the tide seems to be changing. When I heard that Fiesta Texas was getting a shipment from B&M, I thought it could be parts for Superman Krypton Coaster, or they could be getting the cheapest B&M that I could think of, a small dive coaster. Of course, it turned out to be that small dive coaster, I know 150 feet may not seem small, but it is small compared to the other North American dive coasters, and they all clear 200 feet. This is on the same scale as Emperor at SeaWorld San Diego. They're within 100 feet of each other in length, within 10 feet in height, and they post the same top speed. Emperor cost $11 million, and I have no reason to think that Cliffhanger is much different. This may be a little more than your typical Six Flags coaster, but not much. But don't let that take the wind out of your sails just yet. This edition is for Fiesta Texas. Six Flags likes the park. It often serves as their testing ground for new models, but it's not one of their big markets. This could mean bigger and better things for their big three in the future. Magic Mountain serving Los Angeles, Great Adventure serving New York, and Great America serving Chicago. If Michael Spanos is turning towards the Cedar Fair model, maybe a B&M Giga isn't off the table. Maybe we can see a mock multi-launch at Great Adventure after all. Maybe a mock extreme spinner is in any of these parks' future. All three of these parks have a hyper, so I doubt that we'll see anything like that happen. But maybe we could see something for the middle tier parks. A park like St. Louis could really use a B&M Hyper, even if it's a smaller one, like Goliath at La Ronde. That option could be back in play under the Cedar Fair model. A park like Over Texas could be a candidate for a wing coaster, something the park could really use. New England and Over Georgia could be in the market for a small wing coaster or a dive coaster just like Cliffhanger. 
Discovery Kingdom doesn't seem to have a lot of space, but with their 150 foot height limit, this also seems like an awesome option for them. But where does that leave the lower tier parks? Six Flags America, Laron, Great Escape, Frontier City, Darien Lake. Among all of them, the last new adult coaster that Six Flags added was 15 years ago, and that was Goliath at Laron. Some of these parks have gotten some hand-me-down since, but in order to find their last new big ground-up coaster, you have to go back to the tail end of their spending spree right before bankruptcy. But with the Six Flags model, these parks have been getting a steady diet of flat rides, water park expansions, or expansions to their kids' area. So would their life get even worse with the Cedar Fair model? Let's take a look at the parks on the bottom rung of the Cedar Fair ladder. Valley Fair, Worlds of Fun, Dorney Park, and Michigan's Adventure. When it comes to new thrill coasters, just forget it. Dorney Park goes back to 2005 with Hydra, Worlds of Fun 2009 with Prowler, Valley Fair 2007 with Renegade, and Michigan's Adventure 1999 with Mad Mouse. And it wasn't even a Cedar Fair park back then. But what have these parks been adding other than coasters? Valley Fair had several additions to Planet Snoopy in 2011, and they've gotten five flat rides since then. So basically, they're averaging one every two years. Worlds of Fun also had a big Planet Snoopy addition in 2016, and otherwise, they've added six flat rides. Dorney Park has only added three rides in the last 10 years, all of them family friendly, and they also received the relocated Stinger, which only lasted six years. Michigan's Adventure is the saddest of the bunch. They just opened four new kids rides in 2021, but before then, you're just looking at the Lakeside Gliders back in 2013. Michigan's Adventure aside, these low tier Cedar Fair parks aren't much worse off than the bottom of the Six Flags chain, so they get a small addition every other year compared to every year. Not much of a difference. The only thing is, Six Flags may want to start charging more for everything if they want to mirror what Cedar Fair is doing. Being a pass holder for both chains, with the dining and drink plan, Six Flags is definitely the better bargain, but everything about Cedar Fair is better quality. In the end, do I think that Six Flags will be better off with the Cedar Fair model? Absolutely. Quality over quantity is almost always a good thing. Cedar Fair has been responsible and measured with all their additions, and it seems like they're living in the perfect middle ground between the wild Six Flags swings. The drunken rampant spending of 1999 and 2000 compared to the penny pinching since 2010. I totally understand the Six Flags model, especially from the standpoint of the general public. It seems like a great idea to draw on people every year, and most people outside the coaster world don't care about clones or anything like that. They just want to have fun. But the numbers don't lie, and Cedar Fair has been so much more successful than Six Flags, at least pre-pandemic. Both chains were hit hard by park closures in 2020, and they had to offer their 2020 pass holders admission through 2021 losing all that renewal revenue. But Six Flags has one potential advantage over Cedar Fair, and that's their membership program. These are paid monthly, and Six Flags offered rewards to anyone who kept their membership active through the shutdown. And that included free upgrades, extra skip the line tickets, a golden ticket for free admission, triple membership points, and other stuff like that that didn't cost a chain a dime, but it was really nice for the members. I kept mine active, so they kept getting my 18 bucks a month for the Diamond Elite membership, and I have no idea how many others did the same but I imagine it was a lot. There's a nice revenue stream that Six Flags kept when times got tough, and hopefully it helps them in the long term, if they change their business model or not. Let's end this by looking at Dr. Diabolical's cliffhanger. It's different than your typical dive coaster, for sure. Since Emperor isn't open, I've only ridden the 200 plus foot dive coasters, so I have no idea how the 150 foot one will feel. It seems like the other ones have a drop that lasts forever, and this one may be a letdown, but don't sleep on that 95 degree drop. This is the same angle that Maverick uses. And even though you aren't getting flung over the top like with Maverick, maybe that beyond vertical angle will provide the punch that you're missing with a lack of height. It goes into an Immelman because, of course, all dive coasters do that. And then that weird zero-g roll that looks like the one on Valraven as it turns up into the brakes. You drop off the brake run, which is usually a good element on dive coasters, up into a turn that seems like maybe it would have been better off as an inversion. Then an airtime hill, which may be awesome or it may do nothing. And then a helix before the brakes. From an enthusiast standpoint, this looks okay. It'll be good for a ride, and it may slide in as the number four coaster in the park. From a GP standpoint, dive coasters are always a winner. They're intimidating, gimmicky, smooth, and fun. And they're usually high capacity rides, though this one only has 21 seats per train. And another important point for Six Flags, in addition to drawing in crowds, is reliability. This is a tried and tested model, and it'll be open most of the time. That impeccable B&M track record of uptime being important for the park and guest experience. Let me know what you think about Dr. Diabolical's cliffhanger and what it could possibly mean for the future of the Six Flags chain. Do you think we're seeing a changing tide or is this just a one-off? Once we get away from the pandemic, will Six Flags go back to adding a small new addition to each park or will we see more coasters from B&M, Mock Rides, or even Intamin returning to the chain? 
I think at this point, anything is possible, and it's a conversation worth having. So sound off in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to drop a like. That's the best way to show your support for the channel. And if you're new here and love coasters, be sure to sub and hit the bell for more content just like this. Also check out my links below for my Discord server, where you can chat with other fans of the channel, as well as my second channel, where I post copyright-free off-ride footage. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all next time.